Bette Midler selling her soul for rock and roll in The Rose, one of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Sneak Previews. And across the aisle from me is Gene Siskel, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. And this is Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. Now, including The Rose, Roger and I are going to take a look at five films, three that we both like and two that we split on. That's a switch from our last sneak previews where we both knocked all five films. A couple good films for a change. Yes. Right? In addition to The Rose, we'll be reviewing the basketball comedy The Fish That Saved Pittsburgh, a powerful new German film, The Marriage of Maria Braun, a profound documentary film called Best Boy, and now Roger begins with French postcards. You know, Gene, it must have been only about five months ago on this very show that we made the pleasant discovery of Breaking Away, the funny and warm movie about college kids growing up in Indiana. And now I think we have another movie like Breaking Away. This must be a lucky year. You think it's good, I don't. Okay, we disagree. But anyway, the movie is French postcards. It's about a group of American students spending their junior year abroad in Paris. The ways of the French are a mystery to them when they arrive, and for that matter, these Yankee undergraduates are certainly a mystery to the French. <laughs> French Postcards follows three of the young American students, their courtships and their romances, as they try to decide if spending a year in Paris is for them. Mushrooms? I, I'm not going to come to Paris to study mushrooms. You going to eat that thing off the street? Yeah. Why did you come to Paris? Well, I'm majoring in romance languages. My school suggested coming here. I figured it'd look good on my records. Actually, I think my parents are just trying to get rid of me. I would have joined the Fond Legion to get here. What's wrong with Oberlin? It's a good school. Yeah, it's also in Ohio. Well, anyway, everyone said that the experience would broaden my outlook on life, you know, coming into contact with another culture. Jesus. Maybe I should have gone to Rome. You know, but they have all those kidnappings in Italy. Well, I mean, they, they cut off your ears and they... And for dessert, how about a chainsaw? <laughs> Those two students attend an exchange college, which is eccentric and just a little bit wacky. One of them gets a crush on the beautiful young lady who runs the school, and she sort of falls for him, too, especially since she's fighting with her husband. And that leads to the classic scene of her husband arriving home a little too early. Look, I'll find a way for us to see each other again. Believe me, nothing's going to keep us apart now. Except death, maybe. Those of drugs. You said. What are you doing here? Well, we were just. Just uh, about to make love. Oh. Well, it sounds like it's been a big night for everybody. Yeah. Alex, let's just go home now. No. No. Kill him! Oh, oh. Albert, stop it! It's your fault! My fault! Let go of me! Running away with him that the poor girl at the answering service are pitiful. Tu vois bien, je suis pas parti. Je veux pas aller en Italie. He didn't go to Italy. Non, mais tu as été ailleurs avec Yvette. Je me suis renseignée. Je connais tous les détails de ton aventure. Then she says that he's been other places with Yvette. He says she knows all about their affair. Joe, so I know what's happening. Qu'est-ce que c'est que ça? And what is this? Qu'est-ce que c'est que ce garçon là? What about him? He means you. Tu prends les blancs becs de l'école pour les mettre dans ton lit. You take some. Um, I, I think he says twerp from school, and you take him home to bed with you. Pourquoi? C'est pour te venger. Pour me venger? What for? Revenge? Pas du tout, Alex. <laughs> Pas du tout. Ah, c'est vraiment touchant. That was Marie-France Pizier as the passionate school marm. She's one of the most magnetic of the newer French actresses. And French Postcards has a lot of fun watching its American and French characters clash in language and culture. There are times when their entire educational experience seems reduced to complete chaos. At the end of their junior year abroad, the Americans may not have solved the problems of the world, of life, or of love, but at least they're definitely ready for senior year at home. I'm surprised at you. What I do now? I, th I think this is more like the Hardy Boys go to France. <laughs> These kids are, I don't know where they come from, a television situation comedy or something. These aren't lively American kids that are over there trying to discover things. They're looking uh, around in the streets, some kid talking about not going to Italy because he might lose his ear. It's a, a juvenile script with these stereotypes of French women who are already ready to jump in the sack with any American man or boy. Marie France Pizier is a stereotype of the French woman. I'm all in favor of stereotypes, but no. these kids are not supposed to, it's not a real realistic film. I mean, it's not really what it would really be like to live for a year in Paris, but they have fun. 
Uh, they get, they have adventures. They learn a little bit about love. They buy a few records. They eat a few pizzas. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Well, that's just my, not my idea of a strong movie. In other words, when you say uh, they're not, it's not a real tough picture, you know, we get into this argument a lot. You tend to like the lighter stuff. I like the tougher stuff. I always feel it'd be so much better if it were kids like the kids we see on the street or no. You know, that's all I'm asking for. A little well, tougher, more real picture. I think you have to look at where this movie came from. It was written and directed by the same couple who wrote American Graffiti, and I mm -hmm. think they're more or less in the same ballpark. They're showing these kids uh, in terms of uh, middle-class values. And it's that not really a nitty-gritty film. And that film was set in 62, and this is now 1979 with real French backgrounds. I think it falls down in between. Big disagreement. Okay, so I'm really in favor of this film, though, And Gene. I'm not. Okay, okay, fine. Our next film, I think, has the year's most intriguing title. Maybe we'll agree on that. It's The Fish That Saved Pittsburgh. It sounds like a disaster <laughs> film about a friendly shark, but actually it's a comedy about a losing basketball team that turns into a winner after it hires three players, all born under the same astrological sign of Pisces, the fish. One of the players is an amateur preacher, Harlem Globetrotter, star Meadowlark Lemon, who would rather slam dunk than baptize. <laughs> and his gospel choir is none other than the terrific recording group, The Spinners. <laughs> well, if you can part the waters, set the children free, you can find a time to walk with me. If you can talk to Moses, set my children free, listen to the children. on time. Oh. The fish that saved Pittsburgh isn't Citizen Kane. It doesn't try to be, of course. It's just a lot of great fun, good music, exciting basketball with Philadelphia star forward Julius Irving, Dr. J, in the lead role as the Pittsburgh team's star player. This is sort of a basketball Rocky. It's almost as much fun. I, I don't think it's a basketball Rocky. I think it's more of a basketball disco movie like Car Wash. I like Car Wash, so that's okay for I me I like too. Car Wash too with its wall-to-wall -wall music, but this time it seems as if the music is wall-to-wall -wall, but nothing else is. They don't seem to have enough dialogue or action. They're just always action. throwing in another song. Action. Great basketball. I go to a lot of rotten basketball games in Chicago. Unfortunately, we have a lousy team, as you know. Yeah. This was very exciting, watching Julius Irving slam dunk in a montage sequence at the end of the picture. The audience I saw the pic film went, went crazy. Well, I, the basketball footage was okay. In fact, I don't want people to get the wrong impression. This is a pleasant movie to yes, sit through, and I enjoyed it. I didn't think it was that great. Okay, that's all I'm saying. It's a pleasant, enjoyable way. You won't get burned if you go see One it. One more objection, though, and that's Jonathan Winters. He's a very good comedian. Here yes. he plays a dual role. He's really not disciplined. He just comes in every 15 minutes and does his stick. He had, stick, a, you had know? a minor role in the picture. Maybe that's the point to be made. It's a nice film. Maybe that's why he came in every 15 minutes. Go on. Minutes. we got something much better Okay, now. fine. Good. The West German movie director Rainer Werner Fassbender isn't well known to most moviegoers yet, but in film circles he's been a creative phenomenon for the last 10 years. In more than 35 films, he's examined the German state of mind in the years after the war. His characters are usually very practically obsessed with the things that are nearest to them, like age, money, jobs, aging, and death. And those are the subjects of Fassbender's first real box office success, The Marriage of Maria Braun. Hanna Shagula plays the heroine, a young woman who marries a soldier in the closing days of World War II, and then, after her husband disappears, barters and prostitutes her way up from utter destitution to become a sophisticated and even ruthless businesswoman. We are getting tired of this. Was hat er gesagt? Er hat das bisherige Ergebnis zusammengefasst. Ich habe irgendwas gehört, dass er müde ist. Das hat er auch gesagt, dass er es satt hat. 
Also was machen wir? Sieht aus, als hätten wir uns da doch etwas übernommen. Vielleicht ist das Geschäft wirklich etwas zu groß für uns. Da müssen wir auf Nylon verzichten und die deutsche Frau weiterhin das Gewebe. Darf ich auch mal was sagen? Ja, natürlich. Sie gehen jetzt in Ihre Küche und trinken Cognac und geben mir eine halbe Stunde Zeit hier. Das ist nicht mehr seriös, wenn ich das bemerken darf. Frau Braun, das hat mit Übersetzungsfragen nichts mehr zu tun. Bitte, Senckenberg. Herr Senckenberg hat schon recht. Ich verstehe nichts vom Geschäft, aber ich verstehe was von der deutschen Frau, von Nylon und Gewebten. Ich verstehe überhaupt sehr viel von der Zukunft, da bin ich sozusagen Spezialist. Und außerdem, wenn die Sache nun sowieso schon geplatzt ist, dann kann es ja auch weiter nicht schaden. Sie können doch immer noch Nein sagen am Ende. Es ist immerhin die erste lustige Idee an diesem ganzen verfahrenen Tag. Bei allem Respekt, Herr Oswald. Frau Braun hat doch wirklich keine Erfahrung auf unserem Gebiet. Dann macht sie eben jetzt welche can tell by the look in her eye there, she's a real survivor. Mm -hmm. Maria Brown has to move carefully in the cutthroat world of German businessmen. She uses her knowledge of men and her own sexuality to move to the top of a big textile corporation. The marriage of Maria Braun uses its central character to reflect the story of many Europeans in the decade after World War II, and Hannah Shigola's performance as Maria is one of the year's most interesting. I know everyone's saying that they like her performance so much. Uh, I can think of a number of actresses, I think, who could have played the role. What I'm impressed with here is the totality of the picture. You know, there are lots of movies where there's one great performance or a great gimmick or a very mm -hmm. topical mm -hmm. story. They got the right issue at the right time. Here's a film where the whole world has been recreated. Germany right after the war with people scurrying around trying to survive get to the top, other people just trying to live if they can. Right, yeah. And he's got the whole world there. I'm always amazed when a film up on the screen can create a whole world where I feel like I've been right there. And what's neat about this is that he creates two worlds in a way. One world is the realistic world of that period after World War II. The yes. other world is the Fassbender world because he likes to put a little edge on things. People are just a little bit mannered. You could see that in the scene that we just saw. The uh, decor is just a little bit too much. The colors are just a little bit off just so you can't really put your finger on it. But there's sort of an attitude toward it. So he does that yeah. and he also does the other thing it's too. It's reality heightened and made dramatic. Right. Uh, I, I, when I saw this picture, I thought, you know, there begin a lot of people who lived right after World War II in Germany mm -hmm. and other countries who are gonna say, you know, I knew characters like that. And that's how they got to the top. They're, you know, they say there's a line about every great fortune is built on a crime. Well, this woman's fortune that she builds is built on a crime. And, and you get the feeling here that we're seeing a real story that could have happened, a great saga, a very entertaining picture. Very I know it's in good Germ film, yes. It's in German, mm -hmm. and some people have a great uh, avoidance of uh, subtitled pictures. This one is easy to understand and very enjoyable. I agree. Our next film, The Rose, tells an old, old show business story. The woman singer who is comfortable only when she's performing and is suicidal when she's not. The Rose is set in the world of rock music in the late 60s, and that's why it bears a great similarity to the sad story of Janis Joplin the rock singer who died of a heroin overdose in 1971 at age 27. Bette Midler makes her film debut in the role of a rock singer whose nickname is The Rose. Midler's character displays the need to be liked that so many performers share. In this scene, she belts out an old rhythm and blues classic while her entourage looks on. I'm putting on my little waitress cap and my fancy high heel shoes. I'm gonna go find me a real man, a good man, a true man. A man to love me for sure. You know, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. I thought, at one time, I actually thought I found myself one, I did. But he held me in his arms. If 
Now that character Bed Midler is playing is a very popular performer, but she thinks of herself as ugly and she's desperate for the attentions of a man, any man, including a chauffeur that she decides to pick up one night and take back to her hotel room. Do you think I'm sexy? You kidding? <laughs> Come on, the Rose wants to know. I think anybody who talks about themselves in the third person is Looney Tunes. You don't, you don't fool around, do you? Uh, I don't have time. You have time for me? You want to go steady? You want to go steady, huh? Do you? Do you? Huh? What the hell? I just stop at the nearest five and dime, get you a box of them chocolate-covered cherries. Oh, God. Do you remember them? Mm. Wrapped all up in gold paper with little cracked hearts all over them. Mm. And on Valentine's Day, the boys and girls used to exchange them with Valentine's cards. And... Mm. Oh. oh, I wish I'd known you when I was in high school. Good acting there, a very needful performance, a good portrait of a woman who wants it all. Bette Midler is just as effective in this film as Diana Ross was in her film debut. And Lady Sings the Blues a few years ago, and it's not easy singing and acting in the same film for the first time for a singer, not an actress. The bottom line on The Rose is that Midler's great, the movie is so-so, and together that adds up to a marginal recommendation to go see it. It's an old show business story, sure, but Bed Midler really makes it sing. Here's where we don't have much of a disagreement. I'm really pretty much in agreement with what you just said. She is good. The movie is nothing new. The songs are nice. It's not too insightful, really, beyond uh, the bottom line that she's got too many drugs and booze in her system, and she's a suicidal. Yeah, you know, I wish in a way, if I have a criticism, that the picture was a little rougher. It's dealing in this rock mm -hmm. world. I think people do wonder why these people who make millions of dollars every year can't somehow seem to hold it together. You know, the, the poor working man on the streets uh, somehow manages to do it. Why can't they? Really tr it's really tough having to make that Learjet, right? <laughs> Some people walking out of the movie say it's too much of a downer. Gee, I wanted more of an up film. I don't agree with that. How can you have an upper about a movie that's basically, no matter what they say, based on the life of Janis sure, Joplin. Sure, but we'll say the bottom line again, Bette Midler makes it worth seeing. Okay, let's move on to a film that both of us really want to recommend to you on this show. Mm -hmm. Most of the films we review on Sneak Previews are films that are playing right now in theaters across the country. The next film doesn't fit that description. But Gene and I want to review it anyway because it's a very special film that has been a big success this autumn at the Toronto, New York, and Chicago film festivals we want to alert you that it might turn up unexpectedly in your town. The name of the movie is Best Boy, and it's a documentary by Ira Wall about his 52-year-old cousin, Philly. Philly is mentally retarded, and the film follows him for three years as his elderly parents reluctantly realize that someday he'll have to learn to take care of himself. In a key scene in the movie and in Philly's life, filmmaker and narrator Ira Wall talks about taking Philly out of the house. I'd been spending a lot of time with Philly but I realized that I'd only ever seen him when his parents were there, and I wondered what he was like without them around. So when summer came, my friend Christine and I offered to take him out for the day. This was an important occasion for Philly and for his parents, because for the first time, he was going out without them. Have a nice time and enjoy it. No peanuts, because you can't chew, you're getting digestion. Go ahead, children. All right. We'll see you later. Hello. See you later. Say anything? Don't you care. Oh, take care of my boy. He, he's out there. He can't wait to get he's out so of here. He's so thrilled. He has no idea. He was never any place, you know, truthfully. Have no time to take him. He really didn't. He was working, and I had housework. I'm not like going to take him. Alone, you know? Where is Parkway High School? 
Iowa. That's on the other side of Grand Central. <laughs> I never did. Mm -hmm. You were never there, huh? No. You're lucky. I ate the tomato heavy, Iowa. Yeah. I washed the dishes, I put my sink. Sure. That's cool. Yes, sir. Best Boy deals with the serious subject matter of mental retardation, but it's not a depressing film. Mm. Philly himself sees to that. He's a special person, cheerful, outgoing, and the love of his parents shines through. And because Ira Wall was not only the film director, but also a trusted member of the family, there are scenes here that another director might not have been able to get. Scenes of confession, of despair, of grief, also of hope and joy. Philly's progress is small. He learns to leave his home and join a daycare program. But it is progress, and we leave the film feeling very good about human nature. I want to make a bold statement. This is as enjoyable a film as I've seen all year. Mm -hmm. I love documentaries. I always see made-up drama movies, always trying to get real. Uh -huh. This is the real stuff. It's yeah. terrific. You make it seem like a real pleasant experience a little bit, and I think it's a tougher film, maybe. The parents keep this kid in the house. Maybe they're ashamed of him. That's why he's 52 years old, and he's still quite retarded. Uh, it's a tough story. It, the it's a story of a liberation of a, of a spirit, of a mm -hmm. human being. Mm -hmm. The filmmaker takes him out of the house for the first time in a long time, and it's a great moment. It's a real growth of a personality. And that's the thing. When you see this film, you have that spine-tingling realization that this is really happening. This is yes. not some story like Charlie. This is really the story of a guy named Philly. And the problem with a film like this, a documentary of any sort, is getting it distributed. Now, it might, it's had a lot of success at the various film festivals. Yeah. It might get distributed in some of the big cities. It might play for a week or two or a month. Audiences who see it really do like yes. it. But then, who knows what the future of the film will be. So uh, that's basically why we wanted to show it on this program. Yeah, right? uh, films like this never get distributed, like a James Bond film, you know, 600 theaters all at once on mm -hmm. the same weekend with big ads all over on television. We're hoping, by saying how much we like Best Boy, that it'll right. get played in theaters where you live. Mm -hmm. Well, now, look who's here, Gene. It looks like our old amigo Spot the Wonder Dog, who jumps into the balcony to introduce the dogs of the week, the movies we think are so bad they ought to be cut up to make ukulele picks. Well, we could have a whole band with the films we got today. My dog of the <laughs> week is a fish, actually a whole bunch of fish. Killer Fish is the name of the movie. It's about a bunch of treasure hunters who discover a pile of emeralds, and to keep everybody honest, the leader of the gang hides the jewels in the bottom of a lake, He's secretly stocked with piranhas. <laughs> now, when his buddies get greedy and try to jump in the lake to try to get the emeralds ahead of him, the film's cardboard fish attack the crook's pants legs. <laughs> now, that's hardly the stuff we associate with a deep-sea thriller, so Killer Fish is more of a movie about pests. Get off my leg. <laughs> than an imitation of Jaws. Really sounds like it's got a lot of bite, Gene. Yeah. My dog this week is the Tong Father, and you can guess from the title that it's a cross between the Godfather, the Tong Wars, and that reliable old standby, mm. Kung Fu. Mm. Sometimes I wonder if they didn't just make one lousy kung fu movie a long time ago and release it under a hundred different titles. <laughs> the battles always look the same, the plots are always the same, mm -hmm. and the karate chops always sound like somebody's attacking in a hog eyed sofa with a ping pong <laughs> battle. In The Tong Father, law officers are after the evil heroin dealer Mr. Ting, who runs the waterfront and spends most of his time practicing slow motion karate on his girlfriends. <laughs> Ting challenges them to a game of poker and they lose and everybody <laughs> chops the table in two. They look tough, but I don't know how far they get in Las Vegas. Not very far. <laughs> so much for the dogs. Now to recap our reactions to the main movies on this show. Roger and I disagree strongly on the American Teenagers in Paris movie, French Postcards. Roger found it tender and funny. I found it full of simpering stereotypes. Roger says, yes, go see French Postcards. That's why there's a yes next to his name. I say no to French Postcards rated PG. And we disagree on The Fish That Saved Pittsburgh, the basketball comedy. I liked its mix of basketball and pop music. I say yes. Roger thought there was too much music and not enough story. He says no. We agree on The Marriage of Maria Braun, the post-World War II German film about an indomitable woman. We both give Maria Braun an enthusiastic yes. And we give a pair of qualified yeses to The Rose, the Bette Midler as Janis Joplin film. She's great in an old, old story. Two yeses for The Rose and two strong yeses for Best Boy, the documentary film about a retarded 52-year-old man. Watch for this film if it comes to your town. It's very special. Two enthusiastic yeses for Best Boy. So I guess I don't even have to repeat. We think Best Boy is a good movie. We hope it gets distribution. We don't know if it will or not, but keep an eye out for and it. And don't right? forget Marriage of Maria Braun. This is a, if you don't like foreign films, this is one to see. It's easily understood. 
and a beautiful film. Very good. And The Rose, we also give two yeses to with Bette Midler. Absolutely. Right. So that's it for this show. Next time on Sneak Previews, we'll review five more new movies, including The Prize Fighter, a comedy starring Tim Conway and Don Knotts, The Stud, a sex farce from England, and Wise Blood, a melodrama about one man's search for redemption. Until then, see you at the movies. <laughs> Funding for sneak previews was provided by this station and by other public television stations. Mm -hmm.